For 40 years, a divided Germany was the frontier of a divided world. The border between the two Germanys was the fissure between East and West, physically, politically, and socially. The Berlin Wall brutally enforced two competing and unequal ways of life. But the outrage of 78 million Germans finally pushed the seemingly immovable world order aside with a momentum that simply would not be stopped, short of a political miracle. In October of 1990, the eastern state was essentially absorbed into the West, and a new Germany emerged. International Video Network welcomes you on this video visits tour of Germany. Today's Germany is defined by natural boundaries. To the north, the angry North Sea and the gentle Baltic. And to the south, the formidable Alps. Germany meets Poland and Czechoslovakia in the east. And the mighty Rhine River flows along Germany's western edge. Germany's borders have meandered about the maps of northern Europe over the centuries swelling and shrinking the fortunes and attitudes of a culture that was at once aggressive and artistic, but never meek. Though the former East Germany is only a third of the united country, it contained the nation's heartland, historic towns and cities, the birthplace of ideas that changed the world. In Germany's west, there are remarkable centers of industrial might, beautifully restored cities and cultural wonders. The cradle of German history lies here, where the rugged Alps give way to a more livable scenery. In this benign valley of Lake Constance, remnants of lake dwellings dating back to the Stone Age have been found, built like these reconstructions on pilings to protect against man and beast. Other tribes left rock-lined burial grounds in the northern part of what is now Germany, on the heath south of Hamburg. Around the time of Christ, the Romans pushed their empire to the Rhine and Danube and brought with them new levels of cultural sophistication. Building technologies, like these house floors heated by hot water basements, were unknown to the native Germanic tribes of the time. Many Roman outposts, strategically located at river crossings and trade routes, eventually grew into modern cities, which today carry names like Cologne, Mainz, Regensburg, Trier, and Vienna. Ruins of castles built a thousand years after the Romans still dot the landscape in many places. They are powerful witnesses from Germany's distant past when the far-flung frontiers of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation had to be defended. Medieval knights built sturdy castles on cliffs overlooking their lands to protect themselves and their subjects. From these high vantage points, the knights could spot wandering traders and collect a toll from them. With the waning of the Middle Ages, some knights turned into raiders, robbing trade caravans and rich merchants. So townspeople began building their own fortifications for protection, just as the knights of the castles had done before. The marketplace with the church and the Rathaus, or city hall, became the center of these developing towns. At first, regional markets were held only on religious holidays, but they soon developed into weekly affairs and made the rising cities wealthy and independent. To this day, markets are held in the shadow of the churches and cathedrals, providing a gathering place and trading center for farmers, artisans, and craftsmen.
In many German towns, the Middle Ages are still alive. It's not a musty history, but a living presence with old traditions. Not a dead museum, but a dynamic world where people live and work, where the past is accepted as a natural component of the present. In these picturesque towns in the center of the country, the quaint live side by side with the ordinary, and medieval houses have adapted to modern life. It may look like a pop-up picture book, but is it likely to collapse like one? Not a chance, says the head of the building department in Alsfeld. The age of a house does not compromise safety at all. Framed timber construction is so oversized compared to what's really needed that one could safely remove half the timbers without weakening the structure. Those crooked and slanted timbers you see on old houses were not that way originally. They warped over the centuries. Wood, after all, is a living material. When we restore houses, we occasionally have to strip them down all the way to the basic frame and repair it first before we can start restoring the inside and the outside. In the Middle Ages, and even into the Renaissance, people lived in a town that was surrounded by a wall, so they couldn't just spread out as we would today. You've seen how narrow the streets are, often no wider than two meters. So in order to gain space on the inside of the houses, they made the upper story jut out from the lower one. Once they started building one story at a time, with the upper story resting on top of the lower one, they could make the upper rooms larger. That figure over there, on the corner of the marketplace, was carved right out of the structural timber. It's actually the statue of the mayor of the time. That kind of decorative carving and ornamentation is very typical for houses built during the Baroque period. Timber frames were the predominant method of building for centuries, varied by local conditions and customs. In the north, Brick is the common fill material for the space between the timbers. For the picturesque roofs, slate and clay tile are most common, or thick and warm thatch in northern Germany. But nowhere do the thatch roofs look cozier than here in the Black Forest. German forests, and the Black Forest above all, are the stuff that fairy tales are made of. Tales of wolves and deer, of enchanted frogs, and gnomes. The sounds of this quiet forest come to the outside world on the wings of a cuckoo. Ever since the 17th century, People here have been carvers. Their mechanical cuckoo clocks caught the world's fancy. Today, specialty shops build not only mass-produced clocks, but also remarkable handmade works of kinetic art. dancing figures are not someone's romantic imagination of the past, but are much like folk groups everywhere, especially here in cheerful and earthy Upper Bavaria, where Germans and Austrians share a common heritage.
These costumes also find their way into a specialty of this area, the painted house fronts. Germans everywhere like to spruce up their houses with flower boxes in the windows. But nowhere do people delight more in the house front frescoes, called Luftelmalerei, than here in the Alps. Sometimes it's hard to tell where three-dimensional reality ends and painted-on make-believe starts. And the subjects are as endlessly imaginative as German fairy tales. Perhaps it's something in the air of the Bavarian Alps that instills these gregarious people with a flair for the imaginative and joyous arts. The son of a man who painted many of these house paintings is a carver in his native Mittenwald. Here, Stefan Pfeffer is in the process of transferring the shape of a small carved model into a much larger wood sculpture, chiseling out its rough contours for carving. Of all the crafts in Mittenwald, none is more famous than violin making. Here, Germany's only violin making school produces masters like Anton Mahler. Like all masters, he started out by attending trade school for three and a half years, then worked as a journeyman with another master for five years, just as he now has a journeyman working with him. Does he himself play the violin? Oh, sure, but he doesn't have enough time, he says. <laughs> Violin making is both an art and a craft. Anton Mahler explains why it takes 160 or 180 hours, stretched over several months, to build one violin. Building a violin involves a lot of different operations. Every part starts out as a solid piece of wood, which is then worked down with finer and finer tools. In the end, all you can use is a fine scraper and sandpaper. One thing many people don't know is that a violin is curved not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. You can see a good example here on this bottom for a viola. It has to be thin to allow it to resonate, but just how thin is up to the judgment of the violin maker. That's really what determines in the end whether the violin has good sound or not. The neck, too, is made out of solid wood. First, the contour is cut very accurately, and then the top, and finally the scroll, is carved out. It looks like this, a roughed out one and a finished one. The scroll is just for decoration. It's one of the few things that has little to do with the sound. Anton Mahler builds it to be right, and he builds it to last. This German attitude is deeply rooted in history and can be seen very well in Germany's architecture. Styles of architecture, and especially churches, are mirrors of the consciousness of the people and of the church and state. So often, they were one and the same. In many cities today, the old churches are surrounded by a pedestrian zone, not only for shopping and strolling, but also as a forum for colorful folk artists. The Romanesque churches from around the year 1000 are the first specifically German in style. They were built by imperial dynasties, like those of Charlemagne and Otto the Great. In their squat massiveness, they are truly castles of God, symbolic of an empire that derived most of its power and unity from Rome. 
the limitations imposed by the technology of the time, like the thick walls, small windows, and rounded arches, are skillfully used to proclaim the power and confidence of the time. Initially, ceilings were flat with limited spans. But when the cathedral in Speyer was built, invention of the barrel vaults made a much larger interior possible. In 1080, King Henry IV initiated the rebuilding, but he was excommunicated by the Pope over the right to install bishops and abbots, so he couldn't be buried in his own church. Henry's son later won removal of the ban, and on the day of the king's burial in the crypt, the son celebrated his success by granting the citizens of Speyer freedom from inheritance taxes and the right to mint money. To this day, whenever a new bishop is elected to Speyer, this huge bowl in front of the cathedral is filled with wine for everybody. The cathedral in Bamberg is very Romanesque in its basic compactness, but the towers, built only a few years later, already show the influence of the Gothic, which was in full bloom in France at that time. Gothic architecture didn't really gain ground in Germany until the new middle class and the craft guilds became more influential in both financing and design. With the pointed arches, Gothic forms allowed much greater freedom of construction, making higher and roomier and more glorious buildings possible. Windows became larger and sunlight filtered through stained glass could stream between the slender pillars. Bundled columns on the inside, soaring but strong, and seemingly weightless flying buttresses on the outside introduced an elegance to architecture that allowed the builder to express the essence of his medieval perception of the world. Religious fervor inspired bold feats of technological pioneering and resulted in monuments both to God and to the human mind and hands. The lacy openness of the tower of the Freiburg Cathedral is a particularly fine example of a daring design. Executed so well, that it has withstood centuries of war, wind, and weather. These soaring cathedrals were the link between the aspirations of the soul and daily life. And even today, they rise high above the surrounding cityscapes, timeless monuments to mankind's spiritual inspirations. vaulted ceilings with their keystones originally made Gothic buildings possible. But as construction became routine, ceilings became more and more ornamental. The influence of the Italian Renaissance slowly became felt. Buildings in Germany, too, took on a more horizontal look. But in general, the Renaissance never became a truly German art form. The absolute monarchy and the age of reason gave birth to the Baroque, the style of Louis XIV symbolized absolute power, which is why the German princes imitated it. This style can best be seen in castles like Würzburg or Schwetzingen or Nymphenburg, where the grandiose layouts display the unassailable power of the state. Even unruly nature in the gardens was subordinated to its will and to reason. The exuberant styles of the late Baroque and its outgrowth, the Rococo, 
were tailor-made with the Catholic southern regions of Germany, where the Reformation, with its emphasis on austerity and hard work, wasn't sitting well with the people. The ornate became playful and weightless. Painting and sculpture flowed into each other like a stage set, and symmetric roundness turned into light-hearted curves and counter-curves. The French Revolution put an abrupt end to that light-hearted art. In the beginning of the 19th century, Germany rediscovered classic antiquity. In Munich, King Ludwig I built a grand plaza in the Greek style. It was this facelift that gave Munich the nickname Athens on the Isar. Ludwig's grandson, Ludwig II, fled into an unreal world of romanticism that revived a heroic Germanic past with medieval legends and myths. Ludwig led a sheltered childhood in the lonely mountain castle Hohenschwangau. When he was only 18 years old, he had to assume the responsibilities of a king. The young monarch immediately alienated his ministers by summoning to his court a man who had just been banned from Dresden for revolutionary activities, Richard Wagner. With Wagner, he shared his dream of recreating the medieval world. Across the valley from his childhood castle, he built Neuschwanstein, his own vision of medieval splendor. Perched on a granite rock, it was originally sketched by a theatrical set designer. This castle has become the medieval castle in the imagination of children everywhere. The castle took 18 years to build, but was never completed the throne remained empty. Wagner finally became too much of a political embarrassment and had to leave Bavaria. The king withdrew more and more into the solitude of his beloved mountains. Riding his sleigh into the night, he himself became somewhat of a myth. More than ever, he concentrated on building. In a lovely valley near Oberammergau, he built Linderhof, a small Rococo cameo set in a narrow strip of formal French gardens. The rest of the park was left natural, except for an artificial grotto, complete with a fantasy lake and a lavishly ornamented boat. It is said that on hot summer nights, the king smoked his hookah on this peacock throne in the Moorish pavilion which he had acquired from the Paris exhibition. The king's lavishness and eccentric lifestyle finally led to proceedings to have him declared insane. In his final days, he was confined to Berg Castle on Lake Starnberg, where he ultimately drowned under mysterious circumstances. Only 50 years later, true madness would take over in Germany. But the Nazi Empire left no memorable architectural monuments. What remains today of Hitler's attempt at grandeur, like his bombastic rallying stand at Nuremberg, is mostly left to be taken over by the more enduring and merciful forces of nature. As for the rest of Nuremberg, the town is a prime example of the vitality with which Germany has healed the massive wounds of war. Not patched, but lovingly and painstakingly restored where respect for the past demanded it, and newly and boldly built from the ground up where only rubble was left. The artisan's courtyard blends beautifully into the old surroundings, a living monument to Nuremberg's medieval past. The town has been famous for centuries for crafts ranging from Gothic sculptures to toys and pewterware, textiles, pottery, and in a very special way, Leibkuchen. 
everybody, but everybody, loves Nuremberg gingerbread honey cakes. Here baked the way they were in medieval times, in the same kind of oven, and from the same ingredients. The dough consists mainly of boiled honey, flour, candied citron, and spices. No fats, eggs, or sugar are used. Honey was the only sweetener in existence when these spice cakes first were made. Fat was rare, so they used ground hazelnuts to keep the dough from sticking to the baking sheet. There is a traditional pattern of citron and almonds that goes on top before the sheets put into the wood-fired oven. When it comes out, and while it's still warm, the whole sheet gets a glaze. Finally, when it's lukewarm, it's cut and put into a box and probably eaten on the spot. Germany is a paradise for anybody who loves the baker's art. From dark to light breads, from cakes and pastries to rolls, cookies, and anything in between, salty, spicy, or sweet, but always fresh and delicious. But when it comes to sweets, nothing can compare with marzipan, a traditional confection so delicious and popular that it is shipped to all parts of the world from here in Lübeck. In its basic form, marzipan has an extremely simple recipe, almond paste and sugar. But the things made from it, by skilled hands and skilled machines, border on the miraculous in their lifelike appearance. Only by biting into this Bavarian sausage called Weisswurst can one tell whether it's made from marzipan, which it is, or whether it's the genuine article made from veal. Sausages are another German passion. They are everywhere, fat and skinny, long and short, hot and cold, indoors and outdoors, as a snack or a main meal. Sausages traditionally are washed down with beer. It seems that every town in Germany, north and south, east and west, has at least one local brewery. These small breweries, like the one in Alsfeld, are the pride of their town. They don't produce huge quantities, but their brewmasters take great pride in their know-how, the all-natural ingredients, and their product and gladly show off their clean operations. The world has one supreme celebration of beer. The locals in Munich call it Devisen, meaning the meadow. The rest of the world calls it Oktoberfest. 
one has the feeling that the year in Munich culminates in this heaven of the Bavarians, this most joyous, most colorful, most lively of all folk festivals. Horse-drawn beer carts take part in the colorful parade. They used to bring in all the beer, but horse carts are no longer sufficient to handle the five million liters of beer needed to satisfy the gusto of the six or seven million visitors, who also put away 76 whole spit-roasted oxen and some 700,000 chickens in two weeks. It's not all beer and roasted oxen and umpapa. Outside the beer halls, the meadow is lit up with a dizzying assortment of traditional and high-tech rides and attractions. The child and everybody can spin, tumble, and whirl late into the night. In a refreshing way, most of Munich dances to a unique melody that's just a little bit out of tune with the rest of the world, a little bit quaint, a little bit like the figures in its town hall glockenspiel. Munich calls itself the metropolis with a heart, and that's how Munich wants to be perceived, with the heart, with the senses, and with joy. disposition, Munich is a sophisticated metropolis with a glorious past, a city that prides itself on being a cultural center, with architecture laid out on a grand scale, and with fine shops and superb art museums. Of all the museums in Munich, one is very special, the Deutsche Museum, the largest hands-on technology museum in the world. 
Just walking through its 30 main exhibits is a 10-mile hike. It brings the natural sciences and technology right to the visitor's fingertips. From ancient beginnings to visions of the future. Who knows how many children first felt the wonder of discovery and the curiosity of inquiry here in this place and then grew up to be the leaders in German technology, building products that are respected the world over for both their level of technical excellence and their standard of quality. Germany is a nation on the move. The transportation system is extensive. The famous Autobahn Highway is known to car lovers around the world from a thousand car commercials. There are no speed limits here. High-speed trains slip through the countryside. Frankfurt is an international air travel center and a hub for domestic flights. It is about an hour flight from here to Berlin, and there is constant commuter service. Until 1989, Berlin was like two sisters raised in different foster homes. The eastern half was apportioned to the Russians. West Berlin, occupied by the Americans, British, and French at the end of World War II, was nurtured by the combined wealth of the Allies. The three sectors eventually became a bustling modern city, an island of free enterprise surrounded by communist territory. At its center is Kudam, short for Perfurstendam, the broad boulevard that was the hub of entertainment in the Roaring Twenties. It is lined with upscale stores, hotels, and restaurants. The avenue is a showcase of Western comfort and glamour. People watching is a world-class sport here as spectators lounge in the many cafes, nursing one of the local beers. But Berlin's difficult task is just up the street. The east end of the Kudam is anchored by the mighty tower of Kaiser Wilhelm Church, a memorial to the terrible destruction of World War II. The ruins' imposing style and dimension recalled the days of imperial grandeur. Berlin was the capital of the Prussian Empire, ruled by the Hohenzollern dynasty. It was built in the 1890s by Wilhelm II, Germany's last emperor. He led the country into World War I, but was forced to abdicate at the war's end. In contrast to the vibrant pace of life in West Berlin, next door, her estranged sister lived in the shadows. East Berlin was controlled by the Russians as World War II ended. They established a starkly different social order. More than 40 years of communism proved a hard taskmaster. Better living conditions in the Western zone led to a constant exodus from East Berlin. It was embarrassing and a practical drain on the labor supply. One night in August of 1961, the East Germans quietly began reinforcing a thin line of barbed wire dividing the city. The Berlin Wall came to symbolize a divided world, a no man's land in the Cold War. Checkpoint Charlie, a heavily guarded passageway between the East and West, was notorious in the lore of spine-chilling spy stories. But just as the wall kept East Berliners in prison, it kept prosperity out. In November of 1989, years of repressed rage finally exploded. Angry hammer blows against the wall reverberated into a mass movement. As suddenly as it had gone up, the wall finally began to crumble. Wall peckers, as they were called, chipped away at communism. And the communists, as if wearily admitting failure, did not resist. A museum exists near the point where Checkpoint Charlie used to be. The Wall Museum exhibits all kinds of ingenious contraptions used in heroic attempts to escape to the West. Homemade airplanes, 
car seats hollowed out to hide a baby. Some succeeded, but many failed. One year after the hammers began to fall, an idea that might have seemed a laughable pipe dream the year before came true. Berlin became one city, and divided Germany was united once more. The landmark Brandenburg Gate, a monumental row of columns with symbols of passage and welcome, was bitterly ironic when it served as a Cold War barrier. Now it is indeed a gate again, the portal to the heart of Berlin. It was built in 1789, modeled after Athens' Topolia of the Parthenon. As Germany reunified, the gate became a symbol of the country's restoration. Its design proclaims the ideals of human freedom and dignity, prevalent during the years when Berlin was the center of enlightenment in Europe. Stretching out from the gate is the city's main artery, Unter den Linden. It's a stately thoroughfare named for the double row of linden trees planted in 1647. This is Berlin's avenue of history, lined with impressive civic buildings. Some of the most dramatic moments in German history played out here. Across the centuries, the matchless precision of the Prussian goose step echoed down the boulevard. In the mid-1700s, in the armies of Frederick the Great, he typified the Prussian spirit that sought a rare balance of order and ideal. In the 17th century, long wars had nearly bled his country to death, but eventually Frederick was victorious. His territory grew, and he turned Prussia into the most progressive state in Europe. The next century brought splendid parades of emperors, and finally, there were the ruthless Nazi marches. And then, East German soldiers. Before reunification, soldiers from the East German People's Army would perform the changing of the guard in front of the Neue Wache. The old uniforms are relics now, sold on the street as souvenirs. On Unter den Linden stands the Palace of the Republic, once the home of East Germany's Communist Party. Built to be both the seat of government and culture, it remains as a center for the arts. Berliners nicknamed the palace the Lamp Shop because of the rows and rows of lights inside. In the spirit of play, the palace also houses another popular pastime, a bowling alley in its basement. The rumble of tumbling pins echoes up from the bowling alley in the basement below. With reunification, there is a renewed pride in Berlin's historical perseverance in overcoming the destruction of war. Not far from the palace, the imposing but artistic Berliner Dome has again become a favorite landmark. Built around the turn of the century to be the emperor's church, its original purpose was short-lived since Germany became a republic in 1919. It seems miraculous that Berlin's oldest medieval church, the Nikolai Church, survived the perils of history. It was built like a fortress. During the officially atheist communist rule, it was turned into a museum. This area was the center of the old city. And with painstaking detail, the neighborhood has been restored to its turn of the century appearance. As in other neighborhoods, a corner pub is never very far away. Nearby is the restored Platz der Akademie, Berlin's most beautiful square in the eyes of many. It is framed by an historic pair of domes. Between them sits the proud National Theater. It's a concert hall now. Every city has a focal point. In East Berlin, it was the Alexanderplatz. Berliners simply call it Alex. This part of town was virtually destroyed in the war, but it's not obvious now. It's a popular place to gather for shopping and strolling. 
The fountain here is a favorite meeting place, but the square's landmark is this television tower. A revolving restaurant 500 feet up used to provide the perfect vantage point for both spies and wishful thinkers. From here, you could see over the wall to the Forbidden West. The two cities shared a common personality trait, a talent for survival. History proves Berlin's tenacious zest for life. The darker the night, the brighter the lights. Paradox was never more comfortable than in Berlin in the 20s. Marlena Dietrich's animal sexuality, Albert Einstein's intellect, Kurt Weill's music, or Bertolt Brecht's enormously successful Three Penny Opera. Berlin in the 20s was, above all, a passionate city where lust and intellect tangled, reveled, and brooded. The kinetic images of artists like Vasily Kandinsky, Max Beckman, and others reflected the times. By the late 20s, Berlin was a madcap city too busy to sleep. Behind the cabarets where biting satires were performed, the alleyways were littered with empty champagne bottles. But there was an edge of desperation to this fever. The city's recklessness was fueled by political turbulence. By the end of World War I, life in Berlin had been reduced to a kind of bare-boned bitterness. A cohesive government was yet to emerge. This was the time of the Weimar Republic a fractious, ill-fated attempt at democracy. Fascists and communists battled on the back streets. As Berlin tumbled into the 30s, powerful industrialists made millions, while the unemployed begged on street corners. The underworld flourished. Emerging out of this frenzy, one man saw that power could be seized by exploiting the ripe anger and mistrust of the time. With ruthlessness and guile, Adolf Hitler rose to the chancellorship and moved into the Reichstag, forging on to become a total dictator. No other building is as haunted by the tragic aspects of German history. Built in the 1890s to house the German parliament, its very design proclaims the politics of expansionism and a society dedicated to social hierarchy and military might. But Prussian ambition paled beside Hitler's brutality in the 12 years he ruled from the Reichstag until the Russian army occupied the bombed out building tens of millions died one of them was Adolf Hitler he committed suicide in a nearby bunker 20,000 Soviet soldiers died in the battle for Berlin alone a memorial to them stands near the Reichstag soldiers have kept up an honorary guard since the end of the war The older generation remembers. Women greatly outnumber men in Berlin and all of Germany. But new generations are more carefree, perhaps not so burdened by history, their relaxed postures a far cry from the more rigid ideals of the past. But there are reminders everywhere. Here at the Olympic Stadium, Hitler held court in 1936 before thousands of spectators. He hoped to use the Olympic Games as a showcase for his theories about a master Aryan race. But black American Jesse Owens shamed Hitler on his own playground. Owens swept four gold medals and was the most memorable athlete of the Games. The street leading to the stadium is now named for Jesse Owens. Later on, East Germany continued the notion that success on the playing field indicated ideological superiority as well. 
While children in West Berlin enjoyed large Olympic pools for recreation, the more talented of their counterparts in the East were trained in state-run schools. And in fact, small East Germany began winning a disproportionate number of honors in international competitions. But the real East-West competition was a lot less sporting. This memorial commemorates the remarkable Berlin airlift. In 1948, the Soviets surrounded West Berlin, intending to choke it off from the West. For 11 months, Allied pilots supplied and fed the city. A quarter of a million flights brought in two million tons of goods. 75 airmen died before the Soviets ended their blockade and gave up the idea of controlling all of Berlin. The East German Republic was officially formed shortly afterwards. West Berlin would continue to be a pressure point. After the wall went up, John F. Kennedy came to Berlin to deliver a poignant message. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. The United States president made that famous speech on June 26, 1963, in front of the town hall in the Schöneberg district. The Europa Center, a shiny shopping mall, sums up the advantages West Berliners enjoyed as part of West Germany, even though the rest of that country was a hundred miles away. A water clock several stories high mesmerizes shoppers. This was the sort of atmosphere of plenty that so beckoned people from the east when the wall was open. Living standards for East Berliners were considerably more spartan, and industry was 20 years behind the West. Now, the much maligned autos made in the East with plastic bodies mingle with shiny Mercedes. There is a good mass transit system, but traffic in the city has greatly increased since unification. As the Spree River runs through Berlin, it surrounds a large island of culture. Five museums here date from the 19th century, a period when art was practically a religion. The Pergamon Museum houses architectural wonders from early civilization. In fact, there are reminders around the city that aesthetic sensibilities have always been appreciated. Parks offer beautiful formal gardens and enchanting landmarks. For example, Charlottenburg Castle, a 300-year-old summer residence for the royal family. Obviously, the Prussian court was not so dedicated to rigid values that more graceful artistic surroundings went unappreciated. Berlin is alive around the clock. It's just expected that residents and visitors in a truly cosmopolitan city should find a meal and entertainment at their convenience. Eating places and clubs stay open till morning and buses run all night. About 16 miles from Berlin is the handsome town of Potsdam. It was Prussia's foremost garrison, but history remembers it as a more recent landmark. Here in the Tudor-style country home known as the Sicilian Hof, 
the victors came to divvy up a defeated Germany at the end of World War II. Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin met in 1945 and decreed the division of Germany. The Treaty of Potsdam was signed on this table. It would turn out to be the blueprint for the Cold War. Potsdam's other landmark is Frederick the Great's splendid Sanssouci Castle. Built in 1745, it was a refuge for this lonely king who withdrew from the burdens of war to his without worry castle. The surroundings reflect Frederick's love of art, music, and philosophy. The king often entertained the French philosopher Voltaire with long evenings of lively conversation, fine food, and flute music composed by Frederick himself. In this land of harsh winters, Frederick discovered a way to grow fruits normally found in a sunny Mediterranean climate. Special niches were embedded in the hill under the castle's foundation. Protected behind glass doors grew citrus, grapevines, and fig trees. Frederick's admiration of French culture is also reflected in the geometrical design of Sans Souci Park. There are surprises, too, such as a delicate Chinese tea house hidden among the chestnut and beech trees. But this style of Chinese decoration came into fashion in the European courts of the 18th century, even in austere Prussia. The company of these delightful Chinese courtiers would surely have chased away Frederick's worries. Resplendent in gold, the pavilion is called Palace of the Sun. The region that was the Republic of East Germany is beautiful and varied. One treasure is the Baltic coast, a wild and lonely shore along much of the coastline. Continuing the tradition of their ancestors, Local people still coax their livelihoods from the sea. At the end of a hard day's work, stout men find shelter in the port of Zasnitz, a small town on the island of Rügen. My name is Thomas Bock. I work in the FBG Zasnitz for three years. I've been working here for three years. There are easy and difficult hours. It is harder in winter when there is snow and ice. And there are nice hours in the summer when work is pleasant. Gemütlichkeit, or comfort, is never very far away in Germany and it means local beers flowing from the tap and bountiful portions of traditional food. One place serving up Gemütlichkeit is this pub in Rostock. It is a lively meeting place and a kind of museum at the same time. Intricately carved ship models line the walls and hang from the ceiling, homage to the port's intimate bond with the sea. Fishermen have been sailing from this port for more than 700 years. In the 13th century, it was part of the Hanse, a federation of seafaring and merchant towns including Hamburg, Lübeck, and Gdansk. This cooperation gave the towns protection and brought them trading prosperity. Rostock's port is still the anchor of its economy. It is the largest and busiest port on the German Baltic coast.
The center of the town is off limits to automobile traffic so that sightseers and shoppers can leisurely wander about. The university here is the oldest in Northern Europe, founded 50 years before Columbus reached America. A fountain of serenity gracefully honors the school's early patrons. Not far from Rostock rests the resort town of Varnamunda, the kind of seaport that turns to the water for fun instead of hard work. A sheltered harbor for private boats, piers, and white sandy beaches makes this a favorite leisure spot. These traditional wicker shelters from sun and wind and the cares of life are found on beaches all along the Baltic coast. Further west, Kulangsborn is another such resort. An old train station here keeps a bygone era alive. The train still leaves every hour for nearby St. Doberon, just as it has for many, many years. It seemed miraculous to find the monastery at St. Doberon standing just as it was in the 13th century. It belonged to the ruling house of the Dukes of Mecklenburg and other royal owners throughout the ages. The brick Gothic style achieved a surprising delicacy. The southern part of what was East Germany is more populated and industrial. In the middle of Saxony and in the middle of Germany's artistic and cultural history is Leipzig. It was said in medieval Europe that all roads lead to Leipzig. And this city remains one of the most important commercial hubs in Central Europe. But it is also the city of music and literature. The first method of printing musical notation was invented here. This is where the great composer Richard Wagner whose proud marches are so identifiably German, was born. And here also his first opera found an audience. Leipzig's proud musical tradition lives on at the Opera House on the Karl Marx Platz. And just across the square, the world-famous Gewandhaus Orchestra has performed since 1781. Leipzig has yet another musical shrine, the music created in the Thomas Kirche on loving ears around the world. Johann Sebastian Bach worked here as choir master for 27 years until his death in 1750. He was also a teacher at the Boys College. The incomparable composer is buried in the church. The old rulers and great merchant families of Leipzig appreciated the finer things in life. 
city was heavily bombed during the Second World War, but some examples of past glories remain. The charming Old Town Hall of 1556, with its Renaissance facade. In 1900, a grand new town hall was built on the foundation of a medieval castle. Both Romanesque and Renaissance, its eclectic style is reminiscent of Germany's early glory under the Holy Roman Empire. At the Madler Passage, shoppers browse in style. Our box Keller, founded in 1525, was made world famous as a setting in the epic drama Faust by the revered poet Johann Goethe. Mephistopheles speaks to Faust about the seller's merrymakers. Ich muss dich nun vor allen Dingen in lustige Gesellschaft bringen. Above all else, it seems to me, you need some jolly company. To see life can be fun. To say the least, the people here make every day a feast. With little wit and boisterous noise, they dance and circle in their narrow trails, like kittens playing with their tails. When hangovers don't vex these boys, and while their credit's holding out, they have no cares and drink and shout. Solang der Wirt nur weiter borgt, sind sie vergnügt und unbesorgt. As a student of law in Leipzig, Goethe frequented the Auerbach Keller, was apparently a somewhat wild young man. There is more proof here that a good gathering place will never go out of style. The Kaffeebaum is a bad place for a diet. It's been serving up tasty traditional German fare since 1694. Dumplings, potato croquettes, venison with forest berries. The ghosts of some illustrious geniuses linger in this coffee house. Goethe, the composers Wagner and Robert Schumann, and the dramatist Lessing. One of the great turning points in religious history began in the town of Wittenberg. It began, as great events so often do, with one man questioning authority. In 1517, a university monk posted 95 theses here on the doors of the Schlosskirche. The monk was Martin Luther, and his notice invited debate on matters of Catholic Church practices. Luther explained the dilemma he felt as a clergyman. Church doctrine had become so perverted that it was an obstacle to pure worship. At last, I began to understand the justice of God is that by which the just man lives by the gift of God. The just man shall live by faith. At this, I felt myself to have been born again and to have entered the gates of paradise itself. The church excommunicated Luther, but he was defiant. The Reformation was set in motion forever dividing Catholics and Protestants. Luther is buried in a tomb near the altar of Wittenberg's castle church. Many think of the German countryside as a landscape covered with black forests, where characters from Brothers Grimm fairy tales hide. The mysterious Hartz Mountains fit that image as well as any place might. The forests are dark and deep. Rustic towns are nestled in long, narrow valleys. Legend says that Brocken, the highest mountain in the range, was the meeting place not of fairy tales, but of witches. In the Hartz Mountain foothills lies the town of Quedlinburg. Still basking dreamily in the Middle Ages, it is famous for its timber frame houses dating back to the 13th century. Although spared the destruction of war, the town has not aged well. But Quedlinburg is on the United Nations list of World Heritage Monuments, and restoration is underway. The 
The small towns that dot the German countryside offer relaxing weekend diversions in the park. It wouldn't be the German countryside without castles. Wartburg dates from the 11th century. It is a German favorite, rich in legends about good and evil. The Countess Elizabeth, daughter of the King of Hungary, lived here. A young widow, she dedicated her life to the sick and poor and was canonized after her early death in 1231. Luther found asylum in the castle after being declared an outlaw. He used his time here to translate the Bible from Greek into German. Traditions are being revived in the market square. Erfurt was a very important merchant and trading center in medieval Germany, as it was on the Via Regia, an ancient Roman trade route. In other words, it was a hotbed of free enterprise. And immediately after the dissolution of East Germany, local entrepreneurs rediscovered their roots. Small private businesses sprouted up overnight. Even Soviet army soldiers stationed in the former German Democratic Republic and now paid in German currency, join the shoppers. The spires of a hundred churches and monasteries once crowded Erfurt's skyline. A good number of them survived the communist years, and the fine details of portal sculpture are among the beautiful art treasures from its past. A short distance away lies Weimar, the shrine of German classicism and home of great German minds, the poet Goethe and the philosopher and writer Friedrich Schiller. A monument to these brilliant cultural heroes stands before the entrance to the National Theater, where Goethe held the post of director. Later on, composers Franz Liszt and Richard Strauss served as the theater's conductors. The tradition of fine theater still flourishes, as seen in this performance of A Doll's House, by Norwegian dramatist Henrik Ibsen. <laughs> Goethe came to Weimar in 1775 tutor a young duke. With his arrival and later Schiller's, the town began its rise to cultural prominence. The duke's castle still holds a grand art collection, including masterpieces by Jura and Sana. Here, too, the influence of Goethe is omnipresent. Poet, critic, painter, journalist, statesman. A giant in world literature. The private world of this Renaissance man comes alive in the home where he lived from 1782 until his death 50 years later. It is tastefully decorated in the classicist style that was popular with the bourgeois class. At this desk, the great thinker worked till the early hours of the morning. The table where he entertained guests is still here. Goethe was fascinated with classical antiquity and Italian style. 
he surrounded himself with these classical treasures. Schiller's brilliant and prolific career was eclipsed by his premature death at age 46. These costumes are from one of his most celebrated plays, Don Carlos. Even though this area produced great cultural contributions to Western civilization, a memorial to some of its worst atrocities stands close by. This is the tragic irony of the nation, and in this region, the glory of the German spirit and its most base barbarism are neighbors. It is said that the red brilliance of the poppies around Buchenwald comes from the blood of thousands of victims murdered in this concentration camp. Larger than life-size statues serve as a memorial, not to the dead, but to those who survived the final solution, Hitler's euphemism for genocide of political opponents the physically imperfect, homosexuals, gypsies, and mostly Jews. Near the Czech border is the Sächsische Schweiz, the Saxon Switzerland. Dramatic rock formations, caves, waterfalls, and mysterious forests are among nature's attractions here, an inviting place for this open-air theater, a popular tradition in Germany. On a mountain above the meandering Elbe River, the Königstein, or King Stone, is perched. The town is a completely fortified settlement that was never conquered. The Saxon court rode out many acrises here, protecting its treasures within these impregnable walls. In this region, porcelain was invented. The story goes that August the Strong, King of Saxony, ordered an alchemist to concoct a formula for gold. He came up with porcelain instead, a fortuitous accident as porcelain proved to be just as valuable for the king. In Meissen on the Elbe, August the Strong founded Europe's first porcelain factory in the early 1700s. Its blue and white onion pattern became a trademark known around the world. Making porcelain is still a local art requiring the same skillful handling of the potter's wheel and the painter's brush. The factory museum displays many precious pieces by its most famous artists. Upstream is Dresden, the capital of Saxony. Dresden lies midway between Berlin and Vienna, geographically and culturally. Because of the city's legendary splendor, Dresden had earned the nickname the Florence on the Elbe. Then the bombs fell. But this time, it was the Allies who performed the tragedy. On the night of February 13, 1945, Allied air raids turned virtually the entire city into a raging inferno. 35,000 people died. Dresden's many great landmarks were reduced to ashes. It took 
half a century, but thanks to local pride and painstaking restoration efforts, some of old Dresden's uniqueness has been restored. The pier along the river is called the Balcony of Europe. Then, as now, it was a place to stroll, to see and be seen. The cathedral, Hofkirche, typifies old Dresden's feudal splendor. With its tower and many opulent details, this Baroque church was one of the most distinct buildings of 18th century Dresden. The cathedral and the Grand Opera House dominated the city skyline. Finally reopened in 1985, this magnificent building is a proud example of perfect restoration. The famous Zwinga, meaning keep, is another phoenix risen from the ashes. It has all the fine accoutrements a feudal lord of the 1700s could have commanded. Fountains, statues celebrating feminine beauty, stunning vistas and lavish pavilions serve as an entrance to its central court. Golden eagles soar above the delicate dome. Historically, Dresden was a culturally enlightened city. Men of letters and science and the arts lived here. A world-famous art collection includes the Sistine Madonna by Raphael, and Turicchio's Portrait of a Youth, Giorgione's Slumbering Venus, and many from the Dutch school. It almost perished in the war, but now Dresden has much to boast about. The same could be said many times over, across all of Germany, a nation both overcoming and building on its past. The two faces of Germany pose side by side in its storeroom of history. A delicate piece of painted porcelain rests beside a Prussian helmet. A copy of Goethe's Faust sits beside Hitler's Mein Kampf. Throughout recorded time, when profound changes altered the course of Western civilization, this small nation has often been at the vortex, constantly confounding those who would predict its future. Just ask the families who were, but are no longer separated by the Berlin Wall. When the Germans finally tore that symbol down, they turned around and sold chunks of it as souvenirs. They put pieces in museums. They pounded some of it into dust. Good metaphors all for a nation physically and culturally at the crossroads of history. <laughs>